I want to talk to you tonight at, about sit, sitting at his feet. So the topic is sit at his feet. Now, I don't know if any of you can relate with me, but this week started out pretty great. So Monday morning, my son, I can't believe he did this. He got up at 4.45 a.m. because he knows I get up at 5.30. And to surprise me, and he went in the kitchen and was banging around. He told me the night before, I'm gonna surprise, I'm gonna do something for you in the morning. So I kind of knew that something was coming. So he's like, just stay in bed. <laughs> and I'm like, no matter what. Like, how long? You know, because <laughs> normally he doesn't get up till like 6.30, sometimes 7, and I get up at 5.30, I'm thinking, I do not want to sit in bed for an hour and a half, two hours. Anyways, so he got up at 5.45 a.m., and by 5.30, served me breakfast in bed. Oh, wow. It was so sweet. He fried me eggs with cheese on top and sausage links. And I don't eat yogurt or, or milk, but he brought me a yogurt and brought me a <laughs> glass of milk. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, my goodness, how sweet. Honestly, I was like, you love him. He's, he's dying to self. I don't care if you feel like you're going to puke. You're choking down this egg. <laughs> Because I, I don't know, but I, I can't have a heavy breakfast right in the morning. I drink a protein shake every morning. Otherwise, I'm just like, and yeah. But I was just like, he loves you. Thank him. Just show him how much you appreciate this. So that was just like the sweetest blessing to my heart. And then I got a video chat my husband. He's in Israel. So he comes home on Saturday, which I cannot wait for. He's coming home Saturday night. Um, I had time with Jesus and my coffee. Yeah, you heard me right. It's a double date. Don't judge, judge me. Coffee and Jesus. Dropped my son off at school. And then I came here to the way at, by like 8.45. And I got busy doing all these things. I had worship playing and some time in prayer. And, and I just got so much accomplished. And I was organized and calm and peaceful. And it was just, it was an amazing day. Don't, don't we all like those days? That was Monday. That was Monday. Then Tuesday came. I couldn't sleep the night before. I was up half the night. So I could barely drag my butt out of bed by like 6.30, which is an hour late. And that is not okay. So while my coffee brewed, I rushed around doing all the things to get ready, to get my son's lunch ready, like all the things that need to get done. And I sat down to pee, just like for a second, didn't even like sit down to have coffee, sat down to pee, and I got a text. And it was my brother-in-law saying, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm kind of busy. Uh, can you find someone else to pick up Tony from the airport Saturday night during the same time that it's one of your best friend's wedding? <laughs> where you're going to be like helping with the wedding and all crazy busy and, and yeah, can you just, and I'm like, oh my gosh, no, this can't be happening. Uh, all of a sudden my mind just started racing and going crazy and I was like, what am I going to do? I can't do this and I just literally had an internal meltdown over this one little thing. It's like, all of a sudden, I was just like, oh no, and everything that I needed to accomplish for the entire week just like stormed my brain. Like, you know at a concert when they like rush the stage <laughs> in a frenzy? That's what happened in my brain. Like all the thoughts of like the shopping, the everything, every single task for ministry, for the wedding, for everything, just all at once. And I was just like, control, alt, delete, can I shut down now? <laughs> Literally, there was an internal meltdown. So anyways, I took my son to school, and I came home, and I just found myself randomly doing crap around the house that didn't matter, that didn't help me accomplish the million things on my list that actually needed to get done, because that quick, I just turned into a Martha. We all know who Martha is, right? When I realized, though, how out of control my mind was and my emotions, I went into my bedroom, and I turned on some worship, and I fell to my knees on the side of my bed, and honestly, the heaviest thing on my mind was, what, Lord, do you want me to teach Thursday? Because I knew I was going to be teaching, and I kept asking, Lord, what do you want me to teach? What do you want me to teach? And it's like crickets. And I'm like, if I can just figure out the, that one thing, I feel like all the rest of the world will, like, all the pieces will fall back into place. 
and my internal calm will be restored. So I was like, okay, God, just tell me, just tell me what I'm going to teach. I tried to let the worship wash over me and pray, but that didn't work. <laughs> yeah. So I realized I, I left that, that time with the Lord and, and things seemed a little bit better, but not like they normally do when I just go sit at his feet. And uh, I called, you know, call a friend. We did the thing. I called my husband. I called a friend and like tried to get wise counsel and comfort and all the things. And then later I had a conversation with God and he's so great to just like correct us and, and counsel us when we really don't want to be counseled. So what he showed me though, that in my panic, I came to him like a demanding two-year-old throwing a temper tantrum internally like a brat um, or like he was some genie in a bottle like, okay, God, I'm here. Tell me what I want to know. Tell me what I want to know. Here, this is my need. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. I'm here. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me right now the way I want it, how I want it. And, and, I, and it's okay to seek God. It's okay to come to him and ask him questions like that's where we should go for wisdom and guidance and direction. But what he was showing me is that it wasn't about just being in his presence. It wasn't just seeking him in that moment that there was something off in my heart. And he wasn't upset with me, but he just used that opportunity to correct me. Just kind of correct you guys. Oh, it's so lovely. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you can relate to this. So then I actually had real time with Jesus. What he showed me is that when my husband left, there was something inside of me that all of a sudden felt like part of my foundation was gone. But isn't Christ my foundation? Mm -hmm. Isn't he my firm foundation and the rock on which I stand? And I realized that that's when the unraveling just started internally in my mind and in my heart. Like, oh my gosh, my partner's gone. What am I going to do? Um, and, and I started just, like I said, getting frazzled and unraveled. And I have the spiritual practice. We all have different spiritual disciplines in our life. And one of the things I do at least once a week is I have time at his feet. I have worship going usually for about two to three hours. Um, there's this amazing church online that, I, that does spawn, does worship sets four times a week and I usually put them on and just spend time with the Lord and that's what just keeps me focused on God it's what keep like bring, keeps me in a state of peace all through my week is having that time focusing on the Lord and just sitting at his feet and I had started skipping that as soon as I felt like my foundation was slightly shaken when Tony left and I hadn't even realized it. It was like, oh no, what am I going to do? And again, during the last two weeks, I've been doing stuff that did not need to be done just because I felt like something's wrong, something's off. And then I just went, so silly, the things we do in our weird brokenness that think we're doing something important that really isn't. But as I was just pondering this with the Lord, I... I, uh, I thought of the, the obvious story about that, this, and that's um, the story of Mary and Martha, which I'm just going to read really quick. And then the Lord showed me another story to share with you guys about sitting at the feet of Jesus. So we're going to just hop here into Luke 10, starting in verse 38. It says, and Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sisters left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. So in the frenzy, when life gets crazy, when things are out of control, it's, it's that place of sitting at his feet that is the most important, is spending time, right? Being focused on the Lord, not all of the crazy million things we could add to a to-do list that probably don't even need to be done, right? 
So friends, I just feel like it's time to kick the Martha to the curb. Kick her to the curb. And we need to like turn back into the Mary, right? She's out, Mary's back. It's time to return to the feet of Jesus and listen to him. Seek him. Seek his face. Just that time and depth of just yumminess in his presence. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, we've all been in moments where we're just in the throne room worshiping God and the whole atmosphere shifts. Things that seemed heavy or burdensome or worrisome are just gone and you're just filled with his, his peace. It's time to rest our souls and let Jesus lead us into that peace that we all so desperately need in this crazy, busy life that we live. Another story I hadn't thought about, I'm going to pop in here, and it's also in Luke, but in Luke 7. This is a little chunk of scripture we're going to read from 36 to 50. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him. Notice that, the, that he didn't say anything out loud, but Jesus knew what he was thinking. So Jesus answered him. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owned, owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had a bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? Do you see her? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Wow. Wow. What she was doing, he says, is a reflection that she had already been forgiven. She couldn't help. When she heard the word in town that Jesus was coming, that he was coming to this Pharisee's house, I didn't know this. I did some research a couple months ago. But when, when I heard this, I thought, how weird that she just barges in somebody's house and just starts weeping all over them. But what I didn't realize is in this area, in this culture, that there's almost like a courtyard outside, and when there would be gatherings like this, it wouldn't be tucked in someone's house. It would be in this courtyard. So there would be, it would almost be like a public venue where there could be people, and, and, and people, common people, would actually gather around when they knew this was happening. Because this is, they, they didn't have any other way to hear the gossip, right? So they would all kind of gather around when, when the import, these important like Pharisees and different people would have meetings and gatherings and have people in their home. And they would sit there and overhear the conversation and just kind of be like a fly on the wall. So when this woman heard that Jesus was coming, I mean, you can just see how much she just wanted to be in his presence. She obviously had had an encounter with him at some point before this where he, he forgave her, right? And, and, and she just 
what felt so good she couldn't help out of this love, this overflowing of love and gratitude, just being there, weeping, pouring out her tears, pouring out this expensive bottle of perfume on the Lord. It wasn't some big show. It was just the, her heart. She couldn't handle being in his presence without this happening. And I just it's just such a beautiful picture of sitting at Jesus' feet. I think, when is the last time that we actually reflected on all that he's really done for us? Like, I'm not saying we take it for granted, but in a way, I feel like sometimes I forget because God has brought me so far. He's delivered me from so much, so much thing, so many things that were done to me and so much habitual sin that I was in. Like, I can't even imagine the high school girl or young 20s girl that slept around and tried drugs on the weekend and got drunk and partied and all the things. Like, I don't even know who that girl is anymore because I'm not her anymore. And it's so easy to forget, but when, when I go to the Lord's feet and I remember, God, this is what you delivered me from, all of the sexual trauma and abuse of my childhood and, and the way you're training to be, me to be a mom that I never got to have, like, wow, God, this is such an amazing journey. You love me so much. You've forgiven me. You pulled me out of such a deep, 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 dark pit. Then the tears flow, the gratitude, the awe and reverence and the honor that we should be giving him as we sit at his feet in awe. Okay, I'm going to compose myself internally and not start crying so I can give you these few tips on ways to sit at his feet. The first one, make time for him. Our daily schedule is different. It can be crazy. I encourage you guys, it works best for me. I think it's good just to have that time first thing in the morning, to schedule time, because we make time for what's important in our lives. We make time for what we value. I, for me, I think it's best before the sun comes up. Some of y'all might think I'm crazy because you just can't get up that early. But it's so nice to have that time before anything is stirring in the house. You know, before anyone moves, before the texts and the emails start blasting your phone, to just be able to sit. You can put your phone on Do Not Disturb. I highly suggest you do that. My, just so you know, if you try and reach me at 9.30 at night, my phone goes in Do Not Disturb. And I don't turn it on sometimes till 9 or 10 or 11 the next morning because I forget and because who knows how long I'm spending with Jesus. Anyways, <laughs> um, you can sit in silence with him, grab your Bible, a journal, a pen, um, read, meditate on his word. This time is going to restore you and refresh you. It's going to draw your heart deeper in love with God. And when you walk away from that time, you're going to likely be filled with a lot more peace and strength and wisdom about how to go about your day and handle all the situations that are going to happen because life is uncertain and things get crazy, right? Anybody who has kids, it's like, shh, even animals. Good Lord. <laughs> also, I highly recommend, ladies, that we all attend church weekly. This is a priority. The Bible talks about that we should not forsake meeting together and gathering together. It's important. And unfortunately, during the pandemic, it became too easy to just skip church, to stay at home in your pajamas and be comfortable and sip your coffee and just recline in your slippers, right? And we kind of, a lot of us let go of, of making that habit. But and not even just for you, I thought, what? What is my son going to remember of his childhood if we slipped into this pattern and stayed there and never went back to church? Like, not just for me and the community and the fellowship that we all desperately need, but also we want that for our children, for our husband to grow deep relationships with other believers. We need to keep our minds focused on him. And it's just a spiritual discipline and habit um, to keep focused on the Lord. Also, participate in a Bible study. Um, 
if you can do this on your own at home, there's tons of books that walk you through different, like books of the Bible, things like that. Um, there's ways to do it online or through Zoom. I'm in a study right now that I'm going through a book with a, with a, a few awesome ladies. Some of them are in this room. And we have a Zoom meeting once a week, and it's awesome because we not only get to talk about what we read, but we get to hear how it impacted each other, and it also keeps you accountable. If any of you struggle with accountability of really digging into the word, this will help you because you don't want to be the one that comes and is like, oh, yeah, I didn't read anything. <laughs> I didn't do it at all. Ha-ha. <laughs> Because I have been that person that struggled with making things um, a daily habit to get into. So if you want accountability, do it. Get into a Bible study. Also, one way is to rewrite the word. Sometimes you could just have that worship music going and you, and you just write the word. Find a, a, a psalm or something that really speaks to you. And there's something that is so amazing when we write. Um, studies have shown that when we write something down, we focus on what we are reading. Um, it, it brings a deeper focus. So what better way to study and memorize scripture than to actually write it out? I used to, um, a lot of times, write it write verses that I wanted to memorize in dry erase marker, like on our mirror in the bathroom, because you can change it, and, and it, you're not going to damage the mirror, too. So um, focusing, meditating on the word, find ways to, to write it, memorize it, chew on it, devour it. Because when we do that, it's a way of sitting at his feet in a way of like, we want to know you, God. I don't just want to know about you, but when I study the word, I know your character. I know your nature, your way, the way you talk, right? Then we know when we're hearing his voice, because if it doesn't sound like the word of God, the God of the Bible, then it's probably the deceiver, the enemy coming in and lying to us, right? So we need to know the word. Also, listening to praise and worship songs. This is like one of the best things about having a, these smartphones that we all have now is we can have whatever song, whatever worship at the tips of our fingers out in the middle of the woods, down by the bay, in our bedroom, anywhere we are, we can kick it on and be worshiping the Lord. If the stress of life starts to overtake you um, and you just kick on worship, I'm telling you, with one touch of a button, just kick it on and invest your time in that, in that moment of worship. Just let the words wash over you, and, and it'll, it will change your focus. It will change your heart posture. Yeah. And, th and that's how we can choose to invest our time, pouring out our love, our gratitude, our honor to him. I would say focus on word, songs that have words that actually lift him on high like that are actually adoring him. There's a lot of worship songs that are great that tell stories, but I like to, to have songs that are actually adoring him, exalting him for who he is and what he's done. It's, it's a heart shift because I think so many of us are us focused and that's our time to focus on him, not ourselves. Also set, oh, sorry. Yeah, number six, set boundaries and say no. Thought I was skipping ahead. You know that setting boundaries is actually good for you. <laughs> and just so you know, no is a complete sentence. I say this to my son at least once or twice a week, maybe once or twice a day. But no is a complete sentence. And boundary busters will try and make you feel guilty for saying no. Um, but we were not made, yes to, made to say yes to everything and everyone in our lives. You will drown. That is not what God made you for. God wants you to have margin in your life so you can have peace. I give you permission, ladies, to say no. Pray If you're not sure about whether to say yes or no to something, just pray about it and tell them, I'm going to pray about that and I'll get back to you. But it's okay to say no. It helps create room and margin in your schedule to do what? To actually sit at the feet of Jesus. 
Because if we're so busy running around like a chicken with our head cut off, we are not going to make time for the Lord. Um, one last thing, which is on there, is that as we were worshiping, I just felt like God was saying to make sure that we leave room, or sorry, that we have a heart of gratitude. That when we come to him, we're focused, like I, I mentioned earlier, of thanking him for what he's done in the past, for what he's currently doing in our life. That, that we are to just have that heart posture of gratitude, gratitude. And, and I thought of that, that verse um, that says, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. And a lot of times, you know, we think, oh, just money. But how much does God love it if we were to give him, to wash over him with our gratitude? How many of you felt so good when you did something for someone? And they came to you and were so genuinely thankful that they just, they, they were in awe. And you could just see it on their face when they, you know, like, thank you so much. You have no idea what that meant to me, what you did. It feels good to be thanked. And he loves it too. We forget. He's like a person. Like, he's a being. <laughs> Anyways, focus on gratitude. Um. One last verse that I wanted to leave with you. Um, it, this was actually um, a message to the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2. It says, you have patiently suffered for me without quitting, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Because I felt like God was saying when I was just asking him what to share with you guys tonight that a lot of us were not doing the things we did when we first fell in love with him. Like slowly life happens and we get off track and distracted. So what are the things you did at first? Did you go to every worship night that you could even find just to sit at his feet? You know, did you enter into every single Bible study just and devoured the word of God like it was all there was to eat? What was it that you did at first? Sisters, if you want a vibrant relationship with God, we need to do the things we did at first when we first fell in love with the Lord. This will never be a wasted investment of time. We have to prioritize any relationship that we have. And our relationship with him is no different. Do you hear his whisper in your heart? I heard him saying, daughters, come, sit at my feet. Come to me. Love and be washed by my love. Let go of your cares and your worries. Let him melt them to the floor as you focus your attention on me. Let my peace flow in and through you once again.